Cross it. Hey everybody, Dr. O again. So we're back here with chapter two on planning a healthy diet. Let's go ahead and dive in. This is kind of a shorter chapter, but really, really important one. So icebreaker. Do you consider the nutrition quality of your food before you make food choices? Obviously, these things are supposed to be happening in a face-to-face uh, -face environment, but um, but do you really think about that, right? We talked last chapter about how convenience and cost and taste generally are more important to people than nourishment or nutrition value. I think we're, you know, we're seeing we're seeing changes. People are starting to take some people are starting to take their diet a lot more seriously. But uh, but you can see here they give you some examples. Uh, people. Uh, when Lee chooses food based on price, which totally makes sense, especially if you don't have a lot of discretionary income. Eli is busy and values convenience, so what's the what's the best food you can get that you can prepare really quickly? Ella wants to perform well on her volleyball team. I think this is one of the reasons that um, um, I've had success, right, is I really have gotten into strength training and uh, I think about food and how it impacts my performance, right? I don't want to eat food that doesn't make me feel good because I need to feel good for what I'm trying to accomplish. So so eating to fuel your body, eating per, for performance, that's that's uh, very good for some people. Emil is trying to lose weight, so obviously thinking about calories and nutrient density, those types of things. Keisha is trying to eat more nutritious food, so that would be someone that is thinking about nutrition quality. And Jamar eats whatever his wife cooks. So some people just, especially if you you know live at home or something, you just eat whatever gets put in front of you. And then nothing wrong with any of these things. It's just uh, you know you should consider nutritional quality whenever possible, but it may not always be your priority, especially in situations when you don't have a lot of money or time. These types of things, right? I think back to when I was. When I was single and lived in Cherokee, Iowa, you know, food was, I had all the money I'd ever need to buy food. I bought, I bought uh, whatever food I wanted. Uh, I had tons of time to prepare it and all these types of things. Right now, it's just different. Right now, I, you know, I'm, I'm commuting more for work and I'm, I'm working more. And uh, when I'm not working, I'm a dad and a husband and we're running kids around and we're, and we're busy. And uh, sometimes convenience has to trump other things. So, uh, all right. So in this chapter, what are we going to learn? Explain how each of the diet planning principles can be used to plan a healthy diet. So that's the main focus of this chapter is how do you plan a healthy diet? Use the USDA food patterns to develop a meal plan within a spe specified energy allowance. So basically looking at what we learned from last chapter about uh, things like acceptable macronutrient distribution ranges. And you know we want to make sure we can get all the nutrients we need within our calorie budget, right? It's it's, it's one thing if you if you eat a thousand too many calories a day, it's pretty easy to get the protein and the vitamins and minerals you need. But how do you de design a diet that doesn't have a lot of empty calories and is nutrient dense enough where you can get all the cal all the nutrients you need within the energy allowance that that would be right for you? Compare the information on food labels. So we'll look at food labels at the end of this chapter. All right. So diet and diet planning basics. So here we see, so what does the word diet mean to you? I think this is really important, right? Words matter, right? Some people would rather use terms like eating plan or eating strategy. Technically, the word diet means a way of living. That's where it came from, a Greek or Latin, I can't remember, but a, a way of living. So your diet is just the food you eat. But the problem is diet has taken on this negative connotation. It's become a four-letter word. We think, like I mentioned in the last video, we, we think of diet as, you know, um, how can I eat? You think about the temporary thing. It's got to start and an end date and we struggle through it as long as we can and we persist on this diet until we no longer can. Well, there's nothing sustainable about that, right? So a diet, and that's one thing we'll talk about in this chapter a lot is this idea of sustainability. How do you, you know, um, consistently good is always going to be better than occasionally great, right? So, so de developing a perfect diet that you can only stick to for a few days at a time isn't helping you reach your goals, especially if you rebound and, and things like that. Um, so tiny changes that you can keep that you can keep up for 10 years are going to lead to a much bigger impact than trying to design this perfect diet. But just the word in diet, like what, or the word diet itself, um, take its power away, you know, like, uh, so your diet is just the way that you're eating. Every, everyone is on a diet, if you want to look at it that way. So here we see this would be an example of someone's diet, their typical day. All right. Um, so foods contain nutrients. So, you know, we, we eat food, right? But the goal is to make sure we're getting the nutrients, right? So we, 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 um, that's why you need a diet that has getting foods from different food, group, food groups because every food group is going to offer different nutrients and, and things like that. Could you survive on a single food substance for your entire life? Well, I guess it depends on what, you'd cons what you consume. But the reason that we, we build a diet is because the nutrients. But we don't eat nutrients, right? We eat foods. But we, so we have to make sure that we build the diet where we're eating the foods that we like to eat and want to eat and we can eat for the long haul. 
but we have to make sure that those foods are giving us the nutrients that we need at the same time. So here we just see some examples about how if you were going to eat some pomegranate seeds and tomato and salmon, each of them would be offering uh, different nutrients up for you. So this is if you're analyzing your diet. This is why it's important to analyze it using a tool like Chronometer, or MyFitnessPal, or these different things because it, once, if you analyze your diet, then you can see which nutrients you're getting too much of, for example, and then maybe cut out some foods that are giving you too many of those, right? If you're getting too many calories, then you cut out uh, cut out the maybe some sauces and sodas or things like that, cream in your coffee that are just giving you really nothing but calories. But then if you're getting too little of a nutrient like magnesium, then we got to find some foods that offer magnesium and we have to find a way to add them to our diet. So that's kind of the, the beauty of, of understanding that foods contain nutrients. Achieve the goal of healthy eating, meal planning. So this is, uh, I think that one of the best, one of the best ways to, to get on a healthy diet is really to find four or five or six meals that you really enjoy, that are very nutrient dense, that kind of check all the nutrient boxes, and then maybe build your diet around those. Now, a variety is important. We'll talk about that. But so if you have several kind of go-to meals that you know are going to give you a lot of nutritional value, then you have then you have like some discretionary calories and you have some meals where you can have a little bit of wiggle room. Personally, that's what I like to do. So I probably have, I have more than four or five, but I have about a dozen different meals that I know I know the nutritional value of the of these meals and I will I will add them into my week in a way where I know I'm getting you know like if I know I'm going to get some salmon once or twice a week and I know I'm going to get a high fiber meal here and there and here so I like doing that so if you if you if you build your diet then you can have you can have meals where you just eat whatever maybe you um maybe you have a really good structured breakfast and a really good structured lunch and then for dinner you just eat whatever your mom and dad or whatever your husband or wife or partner whoever, whoever is making right or something like that or you go out to eat a couple times a week you know we we generally have like Thursday nights is a night that, that um, we just kind of will order in because uh, my wife generally works late on Thursday she has to get up early on Friday um, I take Oliver to his ninja classes on Thursday so that's just like you know so we eat healthy the other times and I'm not saying that we're, what we order won't be healthy either but um, but just we have a little bit of wiggle room there that's kind of what I think of when I think of kind of planning a diet, not for a day, right? You basically plan a diet over days or weeks. And um, and then if you do that, you also can prep your meals. And meal prepping is a different thing, but it's really important. If you look at if convenience and cost are two reasons that people choose to eat the way they do, well, if you prep your meals, then you can save money and you can save time. So the nice thing about meal prepping is, uh, so like I'll just have like a, a couple of protein sources that I'll cook a week's worth of for myself. I'll have a whole bunch of chicken breast maybe, uh, some ground beef, whatever. And then I can, knowing that I can use that to make all manner of different meals by using different sauces and adding different vegetables and these kind of things. Same thing, my wife chops up a bunch of different vegetables. So we have, so we know we have these protein sources, we know we have these vegetables and we can just mix and match them in any way that we want. So, so a combination of planning your meals, planning your diet, and then prepping accordingly can really be a, a lifesaver. Okay, so the goal, eating pattern that provides needed nutrients without excess energy or calories. So we want to be, we want, we want a diet that is giving us enough of the vitamins and minerals and the macronutrients and everything that we need um, without having too much of other things. So we don't want to be overfed or have overnutrition. And we also don't want to have undernutrition. We want to, we want to find that balance right in the middle. So how do we do that? We choose a combination of foods that deliver a blend of nutrients. And then we'll talk about variety here in just a moment. So food is medicine, diet and prevention of chronic diseases. I mean, I, I mean, absolutely, right? Depending on the disease, um, you know, we know we know that um, poor diet impacts your risk of heart disease, cancer, high blood pressure, which leads to things like strokes. Um, I mean, we just diabetes is a is a real clear example as well. So like it says here, diet planning can help prevent serious chronic diseases. So one example would be the DASH diet. The DASH diet DASH stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension, and it's a lower sodium, higher potassium diet that's been clinically shown to lower blood pressure. So the so planning a diet around the DASH diet is a great way to control blood pressure or prevent you from developing high blood pressure, which is which is a, a killer. Um, same thing with if you if you need to lose weight uh, to decrease your risk of diabetes or you need to lower your blood sugar, then a, then planning a diet that will help you control your blood sugar is a, is a great idea. All right. Um, so when you think of some common chronic diseases, I just mentioned a lot of the big ones there. 
Scientific evidence shows that which chronic condition might be prevented in some individuals through a better dietary intake. So you see these options here and take a moment, but it, the answer is type 2 diabetes. So let's go back. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune condition. Um, you know, asthma, similar. It's an immune system disorder. Multiple sclerosis, also an autoimmune condition. So diets can impact those things for sure. No doubt about it. But, uh, but you, can, you can prevent. So with diet and lifestyle factors, you can, you can prevent type 2 diabetes in almost everyone. It's a great example. So you see here it says type 2 diabetes affects approximately one out of every 10 adults in the U.S. Um, first of all, it's not just adults anymore, right? Um, 100 million Americans right now are diabetic or pre-diabetic, and almost all, the huge majority of them are type 2 diabetics. Um, so that means that 100 million people either have diabetes now or are on the path to have it within five years. These are This is an unacceptable number for sure. Um, so it's more common now than previously due to a higher rate of obesity, and then you know diet changes too, I think. So, uh, But weight gain is definitely a big part of it. So I've seen case reports of seven-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds that already have it. Like when I was in college, we would have called type 2 diabetes adult onset diabetes. We can't even do that anymore because people are getting it so much earlier. So now it's just it's just called type 2 diabetes. Great example of, uh, I mean, it's, some studies show that, you know, if you take a 30-minute walk every day and you, you know, de decrease your sugar consumption, just a couple of things like that, lose 5 to 6% of your body weight, and you can virtually eliminate your risk of getting type 2 diabetes, it's pretty unbelievable. And if you get it, as long as you haven't done a whole lot of damage, if you're, you know, you're recently diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, I like to say you can put it in remission, right? And I say remission because you, you know, you can't get rid of it and then just go back to the way you were eating and living and expect it not to come back. But if you make changes, you can, you can, remove your risk for, or, or you can bring your blood sugar down to normal levels. You can remove the need for medications and these types of things, but you have to continue with those diet and lifestyle factors. That's why I always say remission, not cure. Okay, a case study activity. Again, you'll have to go through this yourself, but um, just real quickly, Alicia is a 19-year-old college sophomore. She has pre-diabetes, meaning that she doesn't have diabetes yet, but her blood sugar is climbing. She's having a harder and harder time controlling her blood sugar, which means her body is needing more and more insulin to control her blood sugar after meals. Uh, the doctor has advised her to lose weight to decrease the likelihood that her condition will progress to type 2 diabetes. Alicia tells you that she doesn't know how to begin to make diet changes. You ask her if she would like to begin with one meal at a time, and Alicia responds that lunch is the most difficult meal for her because she buys lunch at the Starbucks on campus. I gotta get a drink here. Alicia tells you that she is always in a rush and hasn't taken the time to look over all the menu choices. So every day, she orders a chicken and smoked bacon panini with a salted caramel cream beverage. Alicia also buys a package of shortbread cookies to go. So you can, you can do the actual whole product and, and you can go to their website and you can build her a healthy meal. I don't go to Starbucks often, but I, I used to work a lot at a uh, Scooters. I'd sit and use my computer there and not work for them. But uh, I know there are better options than these types of things at a place like Starbucks. So let's say if she, if, if she needs to lose weight and control her blood sugar, there has to be a bet, something better than shortbread cookies to take with her when she leaves. And the salted caramel cream beverage, some of those things have like 70 grams of sugar in them. So if she switched to a, uh, you know, uh, a lower sugar beverage and took something healthier with her to go and maybe maybe removed the, the bacon or some condiments from that sandwich, she could transform this meal. She could cut the calories in half easily. She could cut the sugar down by 80% easily, right? So that, this is, so, so play around with it. You can go to the menu and give her some different options, but, um, but there definitely are healthier things that she could do with this meal. And then if you could convince her to prepare her lunch instead and take like a chicken salad with her to school and water or tea, boom, you know, she loses weight. Blood sugar goes down. She's no longer pre-diabetic. So you can you can play around with that. And that's the, you can use this as well. Okay, this is what the, 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 the key of this chapter to me, this and kind of portion sizes. So the six diet planning principles, and, and I'm going to add a seventh one just so you know. So we have adequacy, so an adequate diet, balance, energy control, so correct number of calories, nutrient density, moderation and variety. So let me start with the one I want to add to the list. So there's seven in my opinion. And the seventh is going to be sustainability. As I get older, I just, I realize how important sustainability is. You always want the perfect diet, perfect exercise program, but the perfect thing to do is what you actually can do, right? If you design a perfect diet and you just can't eat it, it's never going to help you. If you design a perfect exercise program that you can't really do, it's never going to help you. Think about New Year's resolutions failing and these kind of things, right? I'm going to exercise six days a week and I'm going to eat perfect. And then by February, you're back to 
your old ways. Well, so tiny changes that you can actually do for a year or five years or 10 years are a much bigger deal. So if you can make your diet 10% better and you can stick with it, it's gonna be the best thing for you. So a sustainable diet, not what's the perfect diet, not the perfect lifestyle choices. What is the best diet that you can easily sustain? So sustainability is, is to me, the most important one, honestly. All right, so let's look at these different terms here and we'll cover them all. Um, so adequate, an adequate diet means, so I like to look at adequ adequacy and moderation first. So an adequate diet means you're getting enough energy and enough nutrients. So adequacy is that floor. Are you getting enough vitamins, enough vit minerals, enough fiber, enough essential fats, enough of everything? So an adequate diet means you have no deficiencies. A moderate diet, so a, let me read the definition, consumption of nutrient-dense foods most of the time and consuming foods that are not nutrient-dense but may be enjoyable only occasionally. So the, the whole point with moderation is to make sure you're not getting too much of things. So if you have an adequate diet, means you're that's the floor. You're meeting the minimums. A moderate diet means you're not overdoing things, so you're not getting too much of anything. Too many calories, uh, too much sugar, too much of a certain vitamin or mineral, etc. So an adequate diet is the floor. A moderate a diet is the ceiling. A healthy diet's in the middle there. And that's kind of what balance is. So a combination of foods for adequate nutrients and calories. So you're getting foods from all the food groups and you see some examples there. Um, one type of food will not provide all the nutrients. So a balanced diet is whatever your diet looks like, if it's adequate and it's moderate, then it is balanced, right? That's why um, a vegan diet, a keto diet, a paleo diet, any diet you wanna talk about, a Mediterranean diet, all of them can be ba balanced. When you, when you put the diet together and you formulate it, are you getting enough of everything without getting too much of anything. That's what a balanced diet is. So adequacy is the floor, moderation is the ceiling, balance is in the middle. Number three, energy control. Um, are you eating the right number of calories? And it's not always the same, right? If you're pregnant, it needs to go up. If you're trying to gain weight, it needs to go up. If you're trying to lose weight, it needs to go down. But um, energy control means you're eating the number of calories that you need. So you see there your basic energy needs, which would be your, your basal metabolic rate, your resting energy expenditure, plus your calories from activity. So if you're an athlete in training, you're going to need more energy. If you're uh, if, if you broke your leg and you're you're sitting on your hind end for a month, you're going to need less energy. So energy control is: Are you eating the appropriate number of calories for your needs and your goals? Number four, nutrient density. So nutrient density is. So let me read this, and I'll kind of expand. Variety and amount of nutrients in relation to calorie content. So a, a nutrient-dense food is gonna offer a lot of nutrients um, per calorie. The opposite would be empty calories. Think about like a soda. A soda is empty calories. It's basically all calories, no nutrients. Something like, um, well, if you're looking for nutrient density, like the most nutrient-dense food on the planet is usually organ meats. So like a, a liver, like liver, you know, calorie per calorie, gram per gram, beef liver is gonna offer more nutrient density than anything else. Uh, so generally, organ meats are number one, seafoods are number two, then you get into things like vegetables and, and, and fruit. Uh, so, because even vegetables versus fruit, there's nothing wrong with fruit, but vegetables are gonna be more nutrient dense than fruit because they both offer a lot of vitamins and minerals and fiber, but vegetables have generally have less calories. So nutrient density is how many nutrients can you get per calorie? And that's where I think if you're going to design a healthy diet, I've already mentioned there's no such thing as a single perfect diet and everyone's diet is going to look different. But in the end, however you're eating, you want a nutrient dense diet. Most of the foods that you eat should offer a lot of nutritional value per calorie. Not saying everything you eat should be low calorie, but there should be, when you're eating something, it should it should give you more than calories. And that's the idea of nutrient density. So if you plan a diet, you can get all the nutrients you need or almost all the nutrients you need from the basic foods you're eating. Uh, generally speaking, a diet with whole foods that are that are less processed is going to be better from a nutrient density standpoint. Um, eating, you know, eating things like, like seafood and fruits and vegetables versus uh, junk food. All right, uh, I already mentioned moderation. So the last one on here is variety. So selection of foods from each food group and varying choices within groups. So what is that, why is that important? If you have a lot of variety in your diet, first of all, each food group is gonna offer something, right? You're gonna get, there are nutrients you get from maybe grains and fiber you get from grains that you don't get from meat and, and there's calcium you get from dairy that you don't get from fruit, for example. So if you're eating a variety of foods from different food groups and then within those groups, there's some variety, that's gonna, the key with variety is it keeps you from getting too little of some things, but also too much of some things, right? If, if, if the only fruit you eat is whatever, grapes, let's say, 
Um, well, you're going to be missing out on the nutrients and the phytochemicals that you get from other fruit. And then you also might get reach a point where you're getting too much of something. Let's see. Let me give you an example. Um, broccoli. Nothing wrong with broccoli at all. But broccoli is a um, uh, a goitrogen. It's called so. Uh, bro you know, some of the nutrients in broccoli could maybe impair iodine absorption. Different things like that. So if you just eat pounds and pounds of raw broccoli every day, well, that might not be a great idea. But if you mix up the vegetables you eat, nothing wrong with eating broccoli, but you also eat other vegetables and different colors of fruits and vegetables, then you're less likely to get too much of any one thing and too little of any one thing. So that's what variety, think like different colors, different types of meat, different types of dairy, different types of fruits and vegetables, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so if you, if you can create a diet, no matter what it looks like, and that's why I said earlier, there's no perfect diet, but if you can create a diet that is adequate, moderate, balanced, and varied, that has nutrient density and energy control and is sustainable, then you've created a perfect diet for you. And then you, you eat that diet, you see how you look and feel and perform. And if you're looking and feeling and performing the way you want to, you stick with that diet. If you're not, you tweak little things and see if things make you feel better or worse. And, and that you do that for, for years. You just, you're an experiment and uh, you keep changing variables and, and try to find what works best for you. All right. Which diet planning principle encourages choosing foods from all major food groups as well as choosing multiple different foods within each food group? So that would be variety. Different colors. Like I said, e eating seasonally is another really good thing to do. If you if you eat the, the produce that's in season, which is going to change with the seasons and times of year, that would lead to some variety as well. All right. Which food combination best represents dietary balance? Remember we said a balanced diet is both adequate and moderate. So we've got, they all have mac and cheese. This one has a roll and low fat milk. This one has broccoli, potatoes, banana water. Uh, you can read them, but uh, I would say it looks like B, right? Because we've got, um, we're getting some grains with the macaroni. We're getting some dairy with the cheese. We got veggies, veggies, uh, fruit, water. Yeah, that one looks like the a most balanced diet because you're getting um, you're getting a lot from different groups. Okay, application diet planning. So understanding diet planning principles, I basically just said that for adequacy, which combination of foods for you provides enough of all the nutrients. If you if you put your diet into chronometer, that's C R O N O M E T E R, that's my favorite, or my fitness pal, um, is it tell, is it spitting out that you're getting all the vitamins and minerals and nutrients you need? That would be an adequate diet. Balance, which foods work together to provide just enough but not too much of any one type of food or food type. Energy control, which foods taken together provide the right amount of calories. So like if you're, um, like when I'm planning a diet for, for my day, I basically plan everything but breakfast first, and then I see where I'm at with my macronutrients especially. The, where am I at with protein? Where am I at with carbs? Where am I at with fat and calories? And then whatever I've left over, that's what I put into my breakfast because I generally like to eat more later in the day, like after I've lifted weights and these kind of things. So it's like, if I have 500 calories to play with, then my breakfast will be 500 calories. If I need to make sure I get more protein in it, that's what I'll do. If I have more calories to play with, then I'll have a bigger breakfast. So that's, that's kind of what works for me from an energy control standpoint. That's another nice thing about just having meals you eat over and over. It's really easy to just plug and play them. Okay, nutrient densities, which foods provide multiple valuable nutrients. So I think about things like, you know, salmon is going to provide the omega-3 fats that you're not going to get from other types of meat, for example. Um, organ meats are off the charts. Uh, seafood, really hot and nutrient dense as well, generally speaking. Moderation, does the diet contain mostly nutrient dense foods in moderate portions? Am I not going over, right? Too many calories, too much of something. And then variety, does the diet include different types of foods from all major food groups? So if you can answer this, the, all these questions, then your diet looks really sound. Helping individuals with diet improvements. So um, when you're building a diet, then my diet may not work for you, right? So I generally, I like a diet that's lower in carbohydrates. It works really well for me. Basically my favorite foods have a lot of protein and a lot of, and, and a moderate amount of fat in them. So it's really easy for me to stick to a diet that's lower carb for other people. That's not true. Their favorite foods have a lot of carbohydrates and, and things like that. So um, so there's, yeah, there's lots of, when it comes to planning meals, you have to consider all these types of things. Obviously, if I was going to design a meal, meal, meal plan or a diet for a vegan, I wouldn't use the foods that, that my diet is based around, things like eggs and stuff. Um, so everyone's unique. Consider their traditions. So what kind of foods? So basically, how can you improve the quality of someone's diet? The best thing to do is to take the diet they already have and make small cheat 
uh, tweaks, sorry. Can you add some vegetables here? Can you remove some trans fats here? This type of thing. Um, so don't make someone eat a diet that's completely new and foreign to them and they're less likely to stick with it. Um, access to food, what foods can they eat, right? So if someone, like if I have a, a student at the college that's asking me about their diet and they and they have the meal plan, they live in the dorms and they have the meal plan, like, okay, let's see what they have to eat for whatever meals they're eating on campus and design the best diet we can with that in mind. And then they can add other foods to it to, to, to figure out the rest of the diet. Food preparation skills. So if you're asking someone to be a chef and they, and they only have a microwave, that's not going to work. Uh, possible health needs. So again, if they're pre-diabetic, I'd probably put them on the uh, the lower uh, carb side of things, for example. If they're trying to build muscle, they need more protein, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then food preferences. You know, you want people to like what they're eating, right? So I don't, you know, every every meal that I eat isn't a flavor explosion. It's not an experience, but I, en I enjoy every food that I eat which is why I can stick with it. And I go weeks at a time without straying from my diet at all because I enjoy what I'm eating, right? It's not, you know, so so if you made me eat a diet that was completely different, I would have a lot harder time. It would take a lot more willpower um, to stick with it. So apply meal planning principles by making small changes to usual and familiar meals. That is the best thing to do, right? So I'll give you some examples that I do. Um, so cereal, I like cereal, but I now eat a high protein cereal uh, instead of a normal cereal from the grocery store. And I use macadamia nut milk instead of regular milk. So I'm getting more of the healthy monounsaturated fats, less saturated fat. So I still eat a bowl of cereal, but that bowl of cereal is lower in saturated fat, higher in healthy monounsaturated fats, and higher in protein and lower in carbs than a typical bowl of cereal. But it's still a bowl of cereal. That's that's an, exa an example of something I do. Um, I like I like making wraps and or tacos or things like that. So I use a lot of tortillas. So I now use more of a whole grain tortilla that's much higher in fiber. So the simp so I've increased my fiber intake without changing my diet at all. I just change the tortilla that I wrap my food in. So those are some those are those are simple simple changes. Okay, uh, maybe changing if you're trying to lose weight um, and you really like ground beef. Well, uh, use a, a lower lower fat ground beef, going from 80 20 to 93 7 or something like that uh, would be another really good example. So meet someone where they're at. Make the tiniest changes you can to get the biggest improvements. Okay, so the discussion here, you got a lot of work to do on this one, but um, you can you can certainly do this. But um, you you know, can can you design great diet? You know, I think doing it for yourself is the right thing to do. But uh, we see some examples here. Can you can you create meals that are adequate ver uh, variety? Mo all the things we talked about. And it, says, and it says to do a vegetarian meal, an ethnic, ethnic cuisine, and then one that requires little to no cooking. These are just, just good practice for um, can you design healthy meals. Go ahead and do that. Then it says to have somebody else assess it. Obviously, we're not together here for this. Just a reflection from this experiment experience once you've done it. Did you draw on your own lived experiences for this activity? I mean, I think you should, right? You should. Um, what are the healthiest meals that you can design that are in those different categories for yourself? The things that you'd eat. Did you find the background information from the textbook useful? Got to go through that. Did you feel that you could be creative during this activity? So I think being creative is great when it comes to um, meals, right? Can you get, because um, um, variety is important and enjoying the food you eat is important. So all good stuff. Okay, a, de a debrief, diet planning principles. What other diet planning information from chapter two would inform you so you could help others? Again, you can, you got to go through that yourself. Then we have the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. Just so you know, this is uh, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans is a report that comes out every five years with recommendations that are used to make our food patterns. So you, you've you probably never seen the Dietary Guidelines, but the information from the guidelines created the food pyramid before, and then we have the plate. So the USDA food patterns, they're now called. But we went from the food pyramid to the Choose My Plate, but the information that went into this came from those Dietary Guidelines. All right, based on what you have learned, if you could help anyone plan meals that might improve their health, who would you want to help? So this would be, you know, I love doing diet analysis projects and um, certainly do it on yourself or you could do it on someone someone else, right? When I, when I took a nutrition class years ago, I did a diet analysis project and, and it, um, I did it on the father of a friend of mine that was interested in losing weight and getting healthier because he had some disease risks. So we, I met with him, designed a diet for him. Um, he stuck with it. He lost 26 pounds. I remember it clear as day. And then he had a heart attack, right? So this is a, it's a crazy story. But um, so the first person that I ever helped uh, with their nutrition had a heart attack. But the doctor said, 
that he would have died if he hadn't made all those positive, because he was exercising too. He made all these positive health changes. He lost 26 pounds and he would have died. The doctor, of course, the doctor doesn't know. They don't have a crystal ball, but the doctor said he would have died from this heart attack if he hadn't made all these health improvements. So I'd like to think that I played a role in saving someone's life uh, with, the, you know, with the nutrition, with a diet analysis and a, and, a, and a diet plan. So this stuff matters. It really does. Right? I, I've changed my diet and I've lost a ton of weight and I'm, I'm, I'm exponentially healthier than I was a few years ago. So you go through this and if you can't think of anybody else, do it for, do it for yourself. But maybe for your parents or a friend or someone that needs your help, you, you may as well take the tools you're learning in this class and, and help someone. Maybe you can save someone's life too. All right, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, like I said, it's every five years, so they'll do it again in 2025. Um, according to the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, healthy eating, eating patterns. So our, our diet should be built around a variety of vegetables from all subgroups, dark green, red, and orange, beans and peas, starchy vegetables. So I agree with a lot of that. I think that um, um, I do believe in animal products, but um, for reasons we can talk about that throughout the semester, but uh, I think that 60% of the volume of your plate should be um, should be produce, you know, basically at all, at all times. Uh, eating different co colors, that's the whole variety thing we've talked about as well. Um, starchy vegetables, we'll talk about the role of carbohydrates as we go. You know, I'm, I'm a little biased because I think that the average American eats way too many carbs and we'll talk about why, but, but I'm not advocating keto diets for people or things like that either. Um, fruits, especially whole fruits, what that means is not don't rely on fruit juices, right? Uh, eating a, eating an apple way better for you than apple juice, right? Apple juice is yes, it has some nutritional value, but from a from a sugar and fiber standpoint, it may as well be soda. Um, so fruits are better for you than fruit juices. Grains, at least half of which are whole grains. So obviously you have more highly refined grains and you have whole grains. Whole grains are going to be better for you because they have more nutritional value. But the big thing is the fiber, right? Making sure you're getting enough fiber. Um, Fat-free or low-fat dairy, including milk, yogurt, cheese, and/or fortified soy beverages. So the um, dairy is, you know, recommended because of the its calcium and its nutrient density. Uh, they recommend the fat-free or low-fat because of the avoidance of saturated fat. But I think that uh, full-fat dairy can be just fine for you as well. Uh, it depends on your diet and your needs. A variety of protein foods, including seafood, lean meats and poultry, eggs, legumes, which are beans and peas, and nuts, seeds, and soy products. So you've got, got to make sure you're getting enough protein. I think that if you're going to design a healthy diet, if I'm designing anyone's diet, I start with protein first. Get all their protein needs met and then figure out where, how, uh, where, where the energy should come from, the carbs and fat, right? Because proteins are building blocks. So uh, get all those. And then whether someone's lower or higher carb or fat, really just it's personal preference to me after that. And then oils. Uh, obviously, you got like you got the oils that everyone agrees are good for you, like your monounsaturated fats. And we'll, we'll do a whole chapter on fat coming up. Resources for diet planning. So the USDA food patterns, again, that would, would have been the food pyramid. Then we got the plate. And then these are the, the food groups. Um, healthy eater and pat. Eating patterns are flexible to accommodate an individual's personal, cultural, traditional preferences and financial resources. So again, each of these circles is going to be different size for different people and different needs. Uh, again, if you're an endurance athlete, very physically active person, then you're going to need maybe more things like starches. Maybe you're going to eat more fruits and more grains. If you if you don't move a whole lot, maybe you're a, maybe you're a power lifter instead of a marathon runner. You're going to eat more protein and you're going to need less of the starches and things like that. Um, and then maybe you're lactose intolerant, so or you have a milk protein allergy, so you can't consume dairy, so you have to use dairy alternatives. So it's just, this is just the the place we start, excuse me, place we start, but everyone's diet's going to look a little different. Depending on individual calorie need levels, there are recommended daily amounts of foods from each group. Let me show you that on this slide. So it isn't just, you know, your, your standard food label is going to say based on a 2,000 calorie a day diet, which is perfectly fine, but not everyone should eat 2,000 calories a day, some less, some more. So I like this table here. You got which ballpark should you be in? Like, see, I consume 2,800 calories a day. Um, so the 2,000 calorie a day diet isn't a good recommendation for me. I need more of these different things than, than someone that consumes 2,000 calories a day. And that's because I'm a, I'm a large man. I'm very physically active. I lift weights about 10, 11 hours a week. Um, so that, that's going to be different. But if I'm cutting or trying to lose weight, then my numbers would drop and so would um, the recommendations. So make sure you can go to the website, the myplate.gov, but make sure that you are, um, you're looking at the, the correct eating strategy for you based on calories and goals and these kind of things. 
All right, uh, this is just this is good. this is showing what we saw earlier. This is a typical meal. So at the end of the day, if you design if you design your meal your meal plan for tomorrow, then um, when you input everything, would you have would you have all the nutrients you need? The proteins, the carbs, the essential fats, the um, um, vitamins and minerals, and all that. Would you have everything without having too much of anything? And that's that's what meal planning is all about. We've just spent all this time talking about it. All right, so then you can do this, but go ahead and um, we don't have groups of students or anything, but if you want to practice this at home, uh, you, you have someone that has a 1,850 uh, calorie a day diet, can you design a, a, a good meal for them? So go ahead and do that. Serving sizes, though this is important. So uh, because if, if, if the, the government's recommend you consume uh, you know, a certain number of servings of something, well, what is, what is a serving? Uh, this, this helps you with portions for sure too. So what, what is one cup from the fruit group? So it'd be one cup of raw or frozen or cooked or canned fruit, but a half a cup of dried fruit would count as a full cup because you've dehydrated, you've removed, removed all the water. So a cup of fruit isn't always a cup of fruit, right? So a half a cup of dried fruit would be equivalent to a cup from the fruit group. Same thing with vegetables. You see a, a vegetable group, one cup of raw or cooked or canned vegetables would be a cup. But leafy green vegetables, it takes two cups, right? I mean, I mean, a, a, a big pile of spinach isn't really that much spinach. So it takes two cups of a leafy green vegetable to equal one cup from the vegetable group. Um, one ounce from the grain groups. So you see one slice of bread, one ounce of ready-to-eat cereal, or half a cup of cooked rice or pasta or, or cooked cereal. So that so those those would be equal to different different amounts of, of grains, um, one ounce from the protein food groups. So we have one ounce of cooked or canned lean meat, poultry or seafood, one egg, one tablespoon of peanut butter, a quarter cup, and that's not as big as you think it is, right? I always think you know a tablespoon. Remember, you make sure you're using an actual measuring tablespoon, not just a, a tablespoon from the uh, from the the silverware drawer. I was doing that where I was getting a teaspoon of, I thought it was a teaspoon of something, ended up being about five and a half teaspoons by the time you actually factored it out. But um, um, a quarter cup of cooked beans or peas, half an ounce of nuts or seeds, or four ounces of tofu. Each of these would be the equivalent of one ounce of, of protein. And then remember, uh, and then one cup from the dairy group, a cup of milk, a cup of yogurt, a cup of fortified soy or other plant beverage like the macadamia nut milk that I drink, um, one and a half ounces of cheese or two ounces of processed cheese. So what do these these mean? So you go back to, again, I'm 2,800. So if I need, um, so you see like 10, so you see like the different, you know, I need two and a half cups of dark green vegetables, seven cups of red and orange, all these kind of things. So um, that's the, the, uh, the stuff that we're going to need using these serve, recommended serving sizes. All right, finally, we're looking at the Nutrition Facts panel, which has been updated recently. Uh, you'll notice that they've added at the bottom here, they've added uh, vitamin D and potassium. I'm really glad they added potassium, especially because um, it is one of the one of the nutrients that it's hardest for people to find. We need a lot of it, and the average American definitely does not get enough of it. So let's look at the different parts of the Nutrition Facts panel. So start at the top here. Serving size in large bold type. Serving sizes reflect portions typically eaten, not those recommended. So uh, always make sure you look at this. You can really get confused by this. If you go to, if you go by, a, I remember uh, seeing a blueberry muffin once at a gas station. A serving was a third of the muffin. So if you just looked at it and you looked at the calories and the carbs and all that, you're like, oh, not so bad. Until you realize that what was in that container was three servings. So you have to triple all those numbers. So make sure you're not confused by those. Make sure you look at a serving size. And if you're going to eat more or less than the serving size, that changes everything else below it. Uh, next, we have kilocalories or calories per serving in large bold type. So again, that's calories per serving, not per container. Uh, I had a student once that was eating, I think it was... Uh, man, what was it? It was a brittle, like a uh, brownie brittle. And she was talking about how she was shocked at how low the calories were, but she was looking at the calories per serving and thought it was the calories per bag. I think there was, I don't remember, there, it was years ago, but there was like eight or 12 or 16 servings in the bag, way more calories than she ever imagined because she wasn't looking at it correctly. So it's calories per serving. Then we have the daily values. So you're going to see there your total fat is usually broken down into, you're going to see saturated fat and then also see trans fat. You might see more. Like if a food has a bunch of monounsaturated fat, it'll probably add it there. So you might see other types of fats, but you're generally, you're definitely going to see saturated fat and trans fats under the total fat. Then we have cholesterol, uh, sodium, always going to see that. So you can monitor your sodium intake. Then notice carbs. You have total carbs, but then you have dietary fiber and you have total sugars and added sugars. So this 
This will help you make decisions like, so some foods are naturally going to have a lot of sugar, but they're, but some foods are going to have a lot of sugars added to them. Um, what else? If you're looking at net carbs, if you're trying to be on a lower carb diet, net carbs would be your total carbs minus things like fiber and minus things like sugar alcohols. So this food here has 37 grams of carbs, but if you've subtracted those four grams of fiber, there'd be 33 net carbs. What, what if that means anything to you? Then you have protein. And then underneath it, uh, oh, added sugars are listed separately. So again, we, we'll talk about how the government recommends um, how little added sugar you should eat. Uh, then the next column, nutrients required uh, for daily values reflect nutrients of concern listed in actual amounts and percent daily values. So remember the percent daily values though, it's going to warn you on the bottom, is for a 2,000 calorie a day diet. So if you're eating less or eating more, keep that in mind. So you see vitamin D, calcium, iron, and potassium in there. Then lastly, a footnote explains the percent daily value, which I just mentioned. It's based on a 2,000 calorie a day diet. So if you're eating 2,500 calories a day, these percentages are not going to be right for you. You always got to keep that in mind. The nutrition facts label. So serving sizes, they reflect typical eating patterns. Um, serving se sizes or similarly similar products can differ. Again, that's, yeah, you look at like cereal. A serving of one cereal is a cup, one's a half a cup, one's a third a cup. So you gotta, gotta, always got to check these things. They can be all over the place. Um, I saw like uh, at the pickles at the store and the serving was three quarters of a spear. So the pickles were in these spears and you and it was only only three quarters of one of these spears was a serving. Or I, one time I saw a container of olives, one and a half olives was a serving. I don't know what you're supposed to do with the other half of the olive, but always be keeping an eye on this. A lot of times you're gonna see serving sizes that are smaller because they're trying to mask the fact that the food probably has a lot of sugar or sodium or something in it. So they, they um, I don't mean, I, I can't say for sure that's why they do it, but it um, re reduces the sticker shock when you first look at the label. So just always be checking the labels. Okay, summary. Did you notice the absence of packaged foods in the meal planning slides? Again, whole foods are usually gonna be better than ultra processed foods for sure. Um, fewer processed foods and more whole foods is best. However, understanding basic meal planning principles promotes the best options in any environment. So again, you can, I could go to a convenience store and I could get, I do this like if I'm traveling or something, I go to a conference, I can go to a convenience store and I can build a diet that at least hits my macronutrients and gets me in the ballpark of a healthy diet. It's not a diet that I want to eat every day, but it meets my needs, right? So, um, so keep that in mind. Once you understand the rules, um, there's, there is some wiggle room there. Uh, meal planning principles are a broad guide as long as you hit those major components we've talked about. The USDA has developed meal planning tools and examples based on food groups, individual energy needs, budgets, cultural traditions, and more. And you still see like your food pyramids and you'll see like different food pyramids for different cultural groups. That's really cool. Great, good, good idea to look at those. And then food labels can certainly assist you. Now you have to understand another thing though about food labels. Um, they can be pretty terribly inaccurate. You know, they can, a food label basically has to be within like 20 or 30% of reality. So you could, you could be designing a perfect diet based on food levels and still be eating too many calories. Again, it's not your fault. It's just, there is this kind of labeling error that can occur there.